I want to read with you, please, in the book of Leviticus, and chapter number 23. Leviticus, and chapter number 23. And let me just look at the connection. We can read from verse 1. Leviticus 23, and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be a holy on my occasions, even these are my feasts. Now, now to verse number 23. And the Lord speak unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Over please to Numbers in chapter number 10. <laughs> numbers in chapter number 10. And the commencement in verse number 1. Numbers chapter 10 and verse 1. Uh, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver. Of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeyings of the camps. And when they shall go with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. But if, and if they blow but with one trumpet, then the princes which are the heads of the thousands of Israel shall gather themselves unto thee. When you blow an alarm, then the camps that lie on the east part shall go forward. When you blow an alarm the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall take up the thicker journey. They shall blow an alarm for their journeys. But when the congregation is to be gathered together, you shall blow. But you shall not sound an alarm. The sons of Aaron the priests shall blow with the trumpets. They shall be to you for an ordinance for the forever throughout your generations. And if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses you, then you shall blow an alarm of the trumpets, and ye shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. And the day of your gladness, and in your solemn days, and in the beginning of the months, you shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. And ye shall that ye may be to you, that may that, that they may be to you for a memorial before you go God. I am the Lord, your God. We know that God will bless us already from his precious words. When we look upon these particular Feasts of Jehovah, we know there are seven. It's good to study, to study the seven in Scripture. We may look at the seven days of creation. We might want to look at the seven feasts. We want to look partially at the, the seven churches in Revelation. And it's nice to notice that there's a great lesson to be learned from the law. When we look upon these seven feasts, they were really a memorial uh, to be observed throughout the generations. Be a constant reminder, remembrance of God's choice of them as a nation. And many applications can be made as far as these feasts are concerned. And you know, when we have seven, it's usually divided into a four and a three. And I would like to divide them just, I'm not going to speak about the feasts, I'm going to speak of one in particular. But I divide them today in the four and the three. And I think today that when we look upon them, we have the Passover, and it's good to study them. If you read in Leviticus number 23, you'll read about them all. And we have, first of all, the Passover. Now, the Passover is that it was their foundation uh, feast. It was really a remembrance of the redemption of the shed blood of the Lamb. And we have heard of that today. 
by our brother, our brother. Uh, and it's wonderful to focus our attention sometimes upon the lamb. It's never changed. The lamb that was there in the days of Israel. We're thankful today, we, as we have been reminded, that we can look upon the lamb of God's providing his lovely son. We look upon him, the Passover. Then when we come to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it's really presenting to us the holy contact of a sanctified people. Wonderful to think of that we are encouraged to be pure and holy. Then when we come to the Feast of First Fruits, which was really an expression of thanksgivings from their hearts, that the Lord that had delivered them from Egypt and had brought them into the land of promise. Then we come to the Feast of Weeks. There was a further renewal of the thanksgivings upon the conclusion of the harvest. I only make a suggestion to you that these four feasts that we can look upon are a fulfillment in our lives, a fulfillment of the past in the person of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. His death, his resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of God. On the day of Pentecost, we, we have been hearing throughout our weekend, the day of Pentecost was come. The Holy Spirit came and the church age was born. We can look back to that moment, what an occasion it was. Many of those souls were saved and the the Holy Spirit was here upon this earth. And and between those first four spring feasts, as we want to call them, and the three autumn feasts that follow, there was a period where really I would say today that corresponds to the present age. This, the day of grace. And it's wonderful to think that this wonderful masterpiece that commenced at Pentecost will be completed when the church is raptured. And we've been, our brother reminded us that just the end of this message, what a joy it will be that we as the church of God will be raptured home to glory. Wonderful to think that from every generation we'll be called home in a moment into the presence of the Lord. And I want to say today, Maybe it's a word in the gospel, and I speak it often. I trust that we, as I speak to you today, that you're ready for the rapture. Every child of God should be ready, ready to be called home, just waiting on the trumpet to sound. And we're going to speak about a trumpet today. And it's good to be ready for the Lord coming. But if you're not saved today, let me again remind you, not saved means you're not hearing the trumpet. And you'll not be called home before, but left behind for judgment. And really, that is the hope of the church of God in the rapture. And we really have to realize that we await his call at any moment. Our Lord, the one that was crucified upon the cross, the one that John could say, behold, the Lamb of God, is the one that we're going to see when he catches away his blood brought church to scenes of glory. It says in First Thessalonians in chapter 4, it reminds us, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangels and, and with the trump of God and the day of Christ shall rise first. But then subsequent to that rapture, God's great prophetic program commences. You see, that program of God especially with, if we think about Israel, it's held in abeyance. Held in abeyance. But wonderful to think it will commence again. And we must remember in the, in the future events of these last three feasts that I'm going to speak about just in a moment, we must remember they have the Feast of Trumpets, a call to the nation from the four corners of the earth, as promised by God through the prophet and confirmed by the Lord Jesus himself. Uh, and we read about those in the prophets of Isaiah. And we can also turn our mind to Matthew chapter 24. And we, read, and we hear those words. A sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they that have forsaken the Lord, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the church, in the clouds of heaven, with the power and good glory. But to remember this child of God, we'll be called home to glory before that. Wonderful thing that we as the children of God will never have to face the tribulation. 
That's the gospel of great comfort. It's a comfort to me. And I trust that every child of God can rejoice today that we'll never have to face the tribulation of God. And today is the thing that we are the children of the day. You know, we have to remember that in the these feasts that we have been looking at, that there will follow a repentant Israel, appreciation of the day of atonement. They will come back. They will repent. And we know that the one whom they rejected at his first coming into this world will become their Lord and King at his second coming. Zechariah chapter number 13. Then the most wonderful of all ages will follow. As foreshadowed in the feast of the tabernacles, the Lord Jesus himself shall reign supreme. Every eye, every eye shall see the King in all his beauty. And, on, and all the earth will hold his sovereign rank. We, we've heard of that already today. And what glorious days it will be. Heaven and earth they will be. And I want today, just for the last few moments of our conference, I want us to focus upon the trumpet. I know we've heard about music. And, you know, I have to say, and I endorse all that our brother Stephen brought to her attention yesterday. Because... Because I believe today that the devil is very coming and using the music of this word just to get his message across. And I have to agree with all that our brother brought to our attention. But I tell you today, there's another musical instrument I'm looking forward to hearing. That's the trumpet. It's wonderful to think. The blowing of the trumpets, it has a distinct dispensational foreshadowing. And we have to think of the great events for redeemed Israel as well as the primary meaning according to their usage in the wilderness journey in the land. But these trumpets, I believe there's a message for us. And what we have read today, I want to leave with six simple thoughts about the trumpet. You know, it's good to hear a trumpet, isn't it? It's good to hear it well played. But there's a trumpet that's going to sound and it's going to gather from the world those that are redeemed. And I want to think now, when we come to Numbers chapter 10, and we read in verse number three, we read these words. And when they shall know with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. That would really say when the trumpet sounded, there was going to be a great gathering. They were all going to gather together. And I would really put my, my title upon this, this first trumpet of the sound of the principle of assembly. Gathering. The sound of the trumpet. Every member of the camp was responsible to gather with his fellows to the door of the tent meeting unto the person of their great leader, Moses. You know, we were over in Africa last year, uh, and I remember very clearly one of the distinctions uh, of the assembly was that there was a gong outside the hall, and when you heard the gong, it was time to go to the meeting. That's the way the Africans worked. And you see, here we have a principle that's laid down in Scripture that there has to be an assembly gathering. There was no acceptable excuse. All should assemble. The call of the trumpet was definite. And as it would sound, it's time to gather. I want to put a trumpet sound to us all today. And I want to ask us all in the presence of God, are we gathered together unto the Lord's name? You see, as the trumpet of God would sound, this message is coming to you today. I'm not talking about the trumpet of the rapter. I'm talking about this message that comes from the scripture today. Uh, and it says to me clearly that there needs to be a gathering together of the people of God. You see, the apostles' doctrine has never changed. Uh, and there's a principle laid down in scripture that there is a gathering center and that gathering center is the local assembly. And I look upon my audience today and I ask you, have you really got the conviction of gathering out of the world unto the name of Christ and gather together unto the assembly of God's dear people? You see, when we, the apostles taught, the apostles taught them, they were saved, they were baptized, but they were gathered unto the Lord's name. And if you're here today, and perhaps, Matt, you can look upon your, your short life here upon earth and say, yes, I'm saved by the grace of God, but I'm not gathering onto the Lord's name. The gathering center 
is for God's presence. That's the assembly of God's people. And I want to say this today. I make it very distinct that the assembly is the place where the Lord's name is. And it's not a matter of going this place or that place. It's not a matter of going to other denominations and say, well, I'll maybe just go to the, the gospel hall today. I'll maybe just gather with the saints. No, brother and sisters, there's a distinction to the assembly of God's people. And really, I would say today that when we look upon the gathering of those people in days past, the Lord's people should be gathered together under the word of God to assemble themselves onto the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I'm gathered today with the local assembly of reward, because that's where the Lord's presence is. And wouldn't it be sad if I was to come to Australia and say, well, I just go anywhere. I just go anywhere. No, brothers and sisters, I want to say today, the, the preciousness of the assembly of God's dear people, that's where the Lord's Is. And that's why when I commendation to say that I'm in fellowship with the assembly in Dromore and I come to Australia and I come to assemblies that they have fellowship with and I enter, they introduce me through a letter of commendation and I stand today assembled with the people of God. And never be confident that's us where the Lord's presence is. And, and today, as I say, we could remember the word of God teaches us clearly. Not to forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. And you know, today, when we talk about the assembly, the church, the local assembly, what is it? Well, it's a place where God's presence is. But you know, it has exercises in the assembly. And when we look upon the assembly, it's just a matter of not coming on a Saturday. No, it's not a matter of coming on the Lord's Day only to the morning meeting and breaking bread and, and so forth. There's an assembly where the gospel is preached. And I have a responsibility to be, to be part of that. And again, when we come to the Bible reading, I need you to be there. When it comes to the prayer meeting, oh, the trumpet will sound, it's time for the prayer meeting. It's time for the Bible reading. And you know, all of the meetings that are associated with the assembly of God's people, I have a responsibility to be gathered together with the Lord's people. I want to ask you, dear brother, dear sister, do you respect the assembly? Do you put your whole effort into the assembly? Do you put your effort into the gospel in your assembly? Uh, and see the work that needs to be done in the local testimony? You see, brothers and sisters, it's a great delight to be part of the assembly. And I know our brother David reminded us of the number of assemblies that were gathered together and represented yesterday as we gathered around the emblem. And as we take our, our, take our leave and go from, our, from this place to another assembly and back to our own assemblies, you know, it's good that we put our whole effort into the assembly together of the Lord's people. Brethren and sisters, it's so valuable today. And really, when I look around me, and I'm not just speaking about Australia, I'm speaking throughout the world today. There is a decline. There is a de decline in the assemblies of God's dear people. And what is it? Well, you see, what's happening is that people are saying, well, numbers are getting small. We need to do something about it. Let's just break down those barriers we've got. Let's open the doors a wee bit wider. And it's good to open the doors to bring on save them and preach the gospel, but not to break down the barriers and say, well, we'll just let anybody in. We'll just gather together and we'll just say, well, we're a big community and we'll just gather together. We're all saved. And, well, I want to say this. I'm saying it categorically today. God's assembly is a place where those that are saved, those that are baptized, and those that are gathered together out of conviction, to be gathered out of the world. And I want to say today, those demarcation lines, those pages that are gathered around the assembly today, is a place that's precious. 
because it's where the presence of the Lord is. It's the presence, it's the place where the presence of the Lord, of the Lord is. I, I want to bring a little uh, practical application because I remember a while back I was in conversation with a Baptist pastor back in Northern Ireland. And you know, we had a debate. Because he was really saying to me, why do you not come to our place? You're expecting me to come to your place. And you're telling me to come. Oh, I said, hold on, wait a minute. I'm expecting you to come just to support the ministry of the word of God, not to preach, but to listen to the gospel preached and so forth. He says, now, why do you not recognize my place? I said, I'll tell you this. It's because it's not in recognition to what the assembly teaches. It's not in recognition of what the apostles' doctrine is. And today, I said to him very categorically, he said, I said to him, you would have a pastor in your place, wouldn't you? He says, yes, I am the pastor. I said, well, there's a problem. My Bible doesn't teach it. it I, the Bible teaches very much pastoral work. There's the work of looking after the sheep and, and caring for the sheep, but it has no place for a head pastor. And I says, there's another problem. He says, I said to him, I said, sometimes you let the women speak in your place. You know, I, I, you, you told me that, that there's the women, you know, it's a great, great sister. She brought a great word to us. And I says, there's another problem. My Bible says that women ought to be silent in the church. So I says, there's the problem. And I says, now, as far as I'm concerned, I can pray for you as a believer. But I say, I respect the assembly of God's dear people. And today, it's a wonderful joy to be gathered to the Lord's people. There's no place like it. I wouldn't really want to be the person that would destroy God's assembly. I would hate that I would bring problems into the assembly. But you know, it's wonderful to think that I dwell in a place where the presence of the Lord is. And you was a great delight. We sing that little hymn sometimes, don't we? Gather to thy name, Lord Jesus. Losing sight of all but thee, O oh, what joy thy presence gives me, falling on our hearts today. You see, that's not only relevant to a Lord's Day morning. I believe the gathering of the Lord's people is all gatherings. I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord at all of our meetings. So today, remember this. When we think of the wonderful joy, as a great delight in the trumpet of the assembly gallery. Now I want to bring to your attention verse number four of, of, of Numbers 10. It says, And if they blow out, blow with one trumpet, then the princes, which are the heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. Here we learn of a distinct gathering of the princes, the heads of the thousands of Israel. God was a God of order. And really we look upon God dealing with an ancient people. In the camp there was authority and order. Leaders were appointed by the Lord himself and they knew themselves. He was a princess and they sounded the trumpet because, well, there was rule. Order. Does God all have order in our assembly? You see, I want to say to this, brothers and sisters, God's assembly is just not a democracy. God's assembly is those that are saved, those that are baptized, and we come from different walks of life, but we come with one real desire, to be gathered unto the Lord's name. And in the midst of it all, God has appointed elders. God has appointed elders. That's what the Bible says. You see, sometimes we look upon a situation and say, well, there's a dear brother. He's been in the assembly a long time. I think we should really make him an overseer. I think we should really give him the position of being an overseer. That's not what the scriptures teach. You know, when we look upon it, it very clearly says, and, and Paul reminds us in the Acts of the Apostles, says, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. You see, the New Testament assembly is under the guidance 
and the rule of godly overseers appointed not by themselves, but is appointed by the Holy Spirit. I want to take a moment because I think sometimes there's a great weakness in our assemblies in understanding the appointment of overseers. The flock need to be cared for. But you know, the appointment of overseers is an exercise in the part of the individual themselves and also appointed by the Holy Spirit. The leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit brings overseers into the assembly. Now I want to say this, because I believe that we're living in a day when many sheep are going astray is because there's a lack of abortion. There's a lack of there's a lack of guidance. There's a lack of authority from our overseer. And I want to say they need, they need great care. You know, it's wonderful to think that God uses the example in his word of sheep. I'm not a farmer, not a sheep farmer, not a shepherd, as far as the natural sheep are concerned. But you know, sheep have a long way of them go astray. And you know, sometimes they get tangled up in, in, in barbed wire. Sometimes they get into difficulty. Sometimes, you know, the sheep, we look upon them, you know, they, they get into uh, an area and they would do damage. But you know, it's wonderful to think the, the shepherd that really cares for the sheep, he has a tender heart to bring the sheep back. And that's a lovely example that the Lord gives us in, his, in the Word of God. And that's the responsibility that we're seeing. If there's an overseer here today in, in, in their conference gathering, I want to say that take great care of the sheep. Take great care of the flock because they need guidance. They need help. There's a time whenever, uh, you know, our brother has reminded us today about John the Baptist in prison. I'm really encouraged with what the Lord, how the Lord dealt with him. You know, he says, go and tell John about how that there's people getting saved. How there's blessing. But he didn't go with a big stick to him. No, no. That's our brother has reminded us. It wasn't a rebuke. But I want to say this, brothers. We're living in a day where the assemblies of God's people, the saints of God, they need guidance. They need overseership. And I say today, if there's a brother here who has an exercise before God to be an overseer, get down on your knees. Don't be approaching the brethren and ask him to be a doer, say, get down in the presence of God, God will clearly appoint him, I'll show to you the appointment of a worship. So today, the shepherd need care, they need feeding. Oh yes, there's a great need for feeding. You know, you wouldn't just put the sheep out and say, well, I wonder are they getting fed? Uh, and you wouldn't put them into a bit of barren ground and say, well, they look after themselves. In the assemblies of God's people, I want to say, overseers should have all the flock of God in their heart and in their soul. You know, I was talking to a dear brother recently, and he was from a bigger assembly. And you know what he said? He says, once a week, once a week, he's down in the stage, and he brings to the attention, he brings to God every member of the assembly. He prays for them. He's a care for the flock of God. And brethren and sisters, that's the care that is needed from an overseer. And also for protection. The sheep need protection. And today that is the responsibility of the overseer. You see, they're called together. The guide is the word of God. Paul calls such an company together to consult with them. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. And warn them of the responsibilities. I want to say this. Some people, maybe younger brethren and sisters, they think the overseer ship is easy. Or they think just to be an overseer, they're the, they're the bosses of the assembly. That's not true. They're accountable to God for the flock. They're accountable to God for the saints of God in the company. And when a child of God goes astray, we have to remember, it's really the responsibility of the overseer to try and get them back. You see, an assembly without godly rule is in accordance with the divine appointment will soon fall into a state of confusion. 
And what will happen is sometimes those, those demarcation lines, they are removed. Again, I want to ask you, dear child of God, especially the overseers of our company today, look after the flock. Look after the flock because they need help and guidance. I want to come to verses number five and six. Because in number, verses number five and six, when you blow an alarm, then the camp that lie on the east part shall go forward. When you blow an alarm the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall take their journey. They shall blow an alarm for their journey. I want to say this. Israel, they require guidance to instruct them on their journeys in the desert. Hence the sound of the trumpet call for priestly men to minister to them. I want to say this. We need ministry. And I say to our brethren today that our exercise to minister God's word, I trust we have a burden. You know, it's so easy. It's so easy sometimes to stand up on a platform like this and say, oh, well, give them that today. I've used our sermon for a while. And let me give them that today. I want to say this has been a burden of my heart today. I come with a burden because God gave me the message. Uh, and we should be exercised before God to bring to the people of God the word of God uh, and to help them. And really, I believe there's a real urgent need today uh, as we near the end of the day of testimony for plain, wholesome ministry of the word of God. Uh, and really, taken into account, there's a great very need. There's the older folks of our assembly. They need help. There's the younger folk of our assembly. They need help. And I'll just put this in passing. I don't read in my Bible of separating the young and the old. I say that the old and the young, they work together. You know, back in Northern Ireland, we were greatly privileged that whenever we were young in the faith and we begin to take an, uh, an opportunity to preach the gospel, it's good to go with an older brother just to learn the roots, no, to be guided by an older brother. And I say this today, brother and sister in the, in the Lord, there's a great need today for wholesome words, ministry of the word of God, that the saints of God may be, uh, again, edified in the things of God. You see, the value, the value of the ministry of the Word of God cannot be overrated. Uh, and really today, we need the Word of God faithfully preached forward and again to look upon all of the practical application and the practical teaching from the Scriptures about the assembly. They're going to grow. You need to help them grow. You need to put the fertilizer on. You need to put those things into their minds to help them to grow in the things of God. Nurture them in the things of God. So that was the assembly ministry. When I come then to verse number 10, this is a lovely subject. Verse number 10 will bring to our attention the great need for assembly worship. Also in the day of your gladness, verse number 10, and in your solemn days, in the beginning of your months, you shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over your sacrifices of your peace offerings that you may be that may be you for a memorial before the Lord, I the Lord, your God. Assembly worship. All the offerings of the gifts of the people of God of old were regulated by the blowing of these trumpets. Their days of sadness, their days of gladness, they are all along, all linked with the sound of the trumpet. The word of God enters into our daily lives. It's a wonderful thing. It is a wonderful thing that causes our hearts to worship. I want to say today, especially to young brother, what do we bring to the Lord's day morning? What do we bring? Do we bring anything? Do we just think of the Lord's day morning as another meeting? Well, it's a meeting as that's given in the scriptures to gather together and the break of the bread and then break of the cup. There's a real reason why we gather. We gather to offer unto God worship. And we come to offer unto God the thanksgiving to our hearts for the one 
to share his passion for who suffered in our stead at Calvary. And really, it should be a prime importance in our life, worship. And I say today, if you pardon me to just make it so simple, worship is not a gift. In our Bible, we are told about those who have the gift of ministry. There's many gifts given in the scripture, but when I think of worship, it's not a gift. It is something that we come with something to offer unto God. We come to speak well of his son. We come together to offer unto God the praise of our lips. Brethren and sisters, sometimes I have to confess my own soul as I gather the Lord's Day morning and I gather around himself. I'm a wee bit flat. I have to go back over the week. Maybe I haven't done enough digging. Maybe I haven't appreciated the Lord as I should. But you know, the whole heart of man, man comes out in thanks to us. And you know, it's wonderful to gather together to remember the Lord. I think one of the things that hurt me most through COVID, we were shut down in Northern Ireland. weren't allowed to gather. I'm sure you were here. But there's one thing I missed. I was gathering together to remember my blessed book. I long to get back to remember the Lord. Long to offer unto him the praise of my life. But you know, some will say, well, can you not do that in your own home? Can you not worship him in your own home? Yes, I can. But to gather together in that lovely environment just to remember him in the breaking of bread and the drinking of the cup. You see, what better time when the trumpet would sound and, and really without doubt we gather together and we gather to remember the beauties of the Savior. You know, we haven't got long upon this earth. But you know, wouldn't it be good from the conference in Kuroi in 2023 that I go away with a worshipful spirit I go with a real desire. I can't wait till Lord's day to get into the presence of the Lord and to offer him worship and praise and adoration. I know but we can we have a continual access into the sanctuary. I know that. But there's a sweetness. And here we have the thought of assembly worship. I want to come to the, the next little thought in verse number nine. The words are these. He says, and if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses you, then he shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and ye shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. It's wonderful that this trumpet can sound in the times of conflict. It's wonderful to think that there's a great source of comfort to Israel, even in the hour of conflict to have the trumpets with them and to have them sounded when they were in difficulty. And you would read very much in first in Second Chronicles chapter number 13 and verse number 14, you would read there that he had promised to deliver them on such a day, and this they you many times, but are not one of standing in condition in record that is given to us. Conflict. You see, brothers and sisters, it's a great when the trumpet sounds, there is distress. And we're thankful that when that trumpet does sound, that there's a God who will help us. And today, as we as we again battle for the Lord, again as we go through this life, we will meet many different conflicts. But there's a wonderful thought that will sound the trumpet. And I want to say this. It's a great preservation and it's a great necessity if we live a victorious life, overcoming uh, and really continuing in prayer in the midst of conflict. Now, I want to say this in passing. Sometimes we have conflict in our assemblies. Sometimes there will be difficulty arises in the assembly. In the company of God's people, what do we do about it? I want to say that we shouldn't do. We shouldn't go to somebody else and spread it about. We shouldn't go to another assembly and tell them about the problem in our assembly. What do I suggest? I suggest to do what the Word of God tells us. Get down in the presence of God and pray about it. God will help in the times of conflict. 
and he would bring very clearly a solution. And I say today, many assemblies have been divided because we haven't waited upon God and we've taken the issue into our own hands. And the old natural man fight against one another instead of committing them to the Lord. Brethren and sisters, I trust today that we would respect each other as the Lord's people. I know we have different opinions and all those things, but I'm glad today that there's a trumpet that we can sound that we can call from God to help us in time of conflict. Do we? Or do we spread it about? All that does, brothers and sisters, is add to their great difficulty. Not only if you're assembly, but the assemblies in the neighborhood. And it's sad to say, sad to say that many, many assemblies have been ruined because we're taking a natural way instead of waiting upon God. So I want to come to the last one as our time is going to a close. I want to come to verses number five and six again. And when it says, when you blow an alarm, then the camps that lie on the east side, east part shall go forward. And when you blow an alarm the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall take their journey, and they shall blow an alarm for their journey. The trumpet sounded in a new way when the camp was to move on. Set up to a new location. They pitched from place to place. It must have been wonderful. Oh, there's the trumpet sounding. It's time to move on. I want to say, brothers and sisters, when they reach their final destination, the land, what a joy it will be for us when that final trumpet will sound. What a joy it will be that we will be gathered home, gathered home to be with the Lord. The Lord is with I don't know, there's something sweet about the Lord's coming. There's something pleasant to speak about, about the Lord's coming. But there's one real sorrow I have. There's one real sorrow. We were talking the other night, weren't we, that we could hasten the Lord's return. There's one real sorrow in my heart. I have children not saved. What should that do for me? It should bring me down on my knees to pay more earnest for me. And brothers and sisters, today, I want to finish on a high note. I want to find, I want to take our minds for a moment when that final trumpet will sound and I'll be called home. You know, many times when I read in my, in the Bible in my study, maybe the thought would come into my mind about the Lord's return. I wonder how it's going to happen. I, I don't know. I have to confess, I don't know how it's all going to happen. But there's one thing sure I believe. It's going to happen. This old body of mine, is it just going to disappear? The garments that I wear, is it just going to disappear? You know, brethren and sisters, I believe today. I trust God's word. Our brother has reminded us today about trusting God's word. And we should live from the great, wonderful promise of God. He's coming back and he's going to take me home to be in the presence of the Lord. He's gone to prepare a place for me. He says, where I am, there he shall be also. And today, what are we waiting for? Oh, what to be good? This lovely Monday. Just to be called from this dark world into the presence of the Lord Jesus. It was wonderful to think. It'd be wonderful to think. It'd be good to be having to face the grave. Wouldn't it be good to be having to pass through the army of death, but to be taken home to be with the Lord for all eternity? I think that's a wonderful thought. And I trust as I have left these trumpet sounds with you today that it might be an encouragement to you. That we might be gathered to his name. That again we might remember of the rule in our assembly. That we might re realize today there's a great need for ministry in the assembly. That we might realize that there's a means of that overcoming conflict in our assembly. And also to realize for the journey home to heaven above. We're going to meet the Savior. And that again is the trumpet of the
We trust that God will bless his word to our soul and to draw our comfort to a close this afternoon. So thank you, Father.